all going to be sealed up, hopefully not to come out anytime soon. If it does, well, there you go. Ah, oh, pants. Well, this is annoying. Now, you know, I said that uh, the toxic hot box was pretty bad, um, you know, with the poisonous fumes and the heat and everything like that. Well, we've got all that, but unfortunately we've added another layer to the discomfort in here because while it's been standing around for a week, a cat has decided it's a great place to have a pee. So now we've also got the hot smell of cat um, something in here as well. So yeah, it's getting worse, sadly, but uh, yeah, made a mistake. We've got to open this thing up. I'm just looking at these bolts for the last time. So. I'm hoping when I put it back together and respray it, it's going to look just as nice as it is does now, really, because the whole point of doing it all in one go was that I never had to take it apart again. So, yeah, you got to do these things sometimes. So let's break this thing open. Say what you want about the guys who broke into King Tut's tomb and had the uh, curse, at least it didn't smell like hot cat piss. Right, you know what I was talking about um, before, about how these um, bolts in here don't really, well they, they do obviously do something for um, keeping oil in here, but really the sealant is all in the, uh, sorry, the sealing is all in the gasket, because look, I've removed the bolts and it won't come off at all, because obviously it's all sealed on there and all stuck on there, so you can see that really the uh, bolts just hold it in place and it's the sealant and the gasket which do all the work here. So let's try and remove this thing and un, uh, uncover King Tut and get him out of here. Ah uh, yes, the problem of sealing something so well, the gasket has split in two. That's how well it was sealed. This is why I didn't want to take the bloody thing apart. Yeah, that's really annoying. Right, we've got some, we've got some work to be getting on with here. As someone put it in the last video, sometimes you have to eat a sandwich made out of excrement. Right. Whoa, it's hot in here today. It's hotter than it was a couple of days ago, so it's phew, it's going to be hot. But we've got to keep this um, clean in here, okay? Because obviously this is all open, so I don't want any dust or dirt getting in here, so I can't open the door. So I am going to get hot. There's no two ways about it. Now, doing the sump was easy. It's all cleaned out now. I've cleaned it a little bit more than you saw there, so it's all ready to go. This is the difficult part, okay? Although this is flat and hasn't got the ribs on the... Um, you know, the cast iron side of this. Obviously, you saw how much rubbish was made there when I was using the... Uh, the uh, wire wheel okay obviously we can't do that down here because this engine is complete and no bits can go in it so it's going to have to be scraper and acetone acetone is an amazing solvent for cleaning stuff it eats plastic uh, much better than isopropyl alcohol but yeah you want to use be careful with it because it will eat all your paint off it'll eat your nitrile gloves your latex gloves i think latex gloves it'll eat anything it's it's good stuff so um, i'm going to use a scraper and acetone in here uh, I won't record it, you just have to take my word for it. It's gonna, it's gonna take a while. So um, yeah, wish me luck. The levels of cat piss smell are um, pretty high in here at the moment, but I think we can do it. Right, I think I'm still vaguely alive in here. It's um, it's pretty bad, but um, as you can see, we've got all that gasket off. That actually went better than expected. In all fairness, look, you can see all the machining underneath and all how it looked before. So, got all that gasket off using a bit of acetone and the scraper. So it worked pretty well. You can see why you don't want that stuff going in your engine. It's all down there, you know. Some of that fibre gets inside um, oil galleries and you know 
big end um, gallery or something like that, it's going to block it up and you're going to have oil problems in your engine and your engine's going to get trashed. So really careful about that. But why have I broken into this thing? Why have I taken apart this lovely engine which I just uh, put together and spent so much time on? The answer is there, underneath that nut, underneath that nut. I, without thinking, well, firstly, um, as some of you will be aware, I'm not actually trained as an engineer or anything like that. I'm not a mechanic. Um, just do this um, as I work it out, really, by reading books, reading the internet, and working out what to do. And sometimes I make mistakes, especially when I'm working through stuff. You know, you, you think, well, it's a, it's a nut, it needs a, a, a split washer on it. Well, when it comes to big end bearings and con rods, you don't put split washers on them, okay? You torque them down, and then in the past you'd put a pal nut to lock it. I'm not going to do that, I'm going to use Loctite again. I do have Loctite on here. Um, or, yeah, you use Loctite, obviously. I put the washers in without thinking, like an idiot. So um, that's annoying, so I've got to remove them. Obviously, these are under a lot of stress, you know, the, the motion up and down here is hammering away here, right? And these um, these uh, washers can fatigue over time and break loose, and also they can loosen off and, um, you know, your nut can come off as well. So you obviously you've got your cap smacking around in there and that's going to wreck your uh, your big end and your crankshaft so you don't want to be doing that so unfortunately these have got to go out i would have liked to have left them in <laughs> but there's no two ways about it they've got to come out they're not right so we're going to undo them and uh, re-put on loctite and then re-tighten these all down so let's get taking these apart then right we've got our nuts on we've uh, loctited them this time the loctite blue was really strong actually breaking it off there so it is bloody good stuff so i think it's better than a pal nut really um but this is all clean and ready to go Fortunately, I had a spare gasket lying around, which is quite lucky. So let's start sealing this thing up again and hope to not open it once more. <laughs> well, this is it all completed then, re-sprayed and ready to go. So I think you'll agree that you can't actually tell that it's been apart. So that worked out really nicely. Now we're gonna cut forward a little bit here to uh, a week or two later. Due to the coronavirus thing, it sort of slowed everything down. So we're gonna look at the gearbox now and how I got that together. So let's cut to that. It's time for the inevitable. I have got to build a transmission. I'm not particularly fond of building transmissions. They're okay. They're a bit of a fiddle to play with and sort out, and they're a bit of a faff. So they're not my favorite thing. Engines are better, but um, it's time to build this T84. And the great thing about a T84 is it's pretty simple to do, but it needs to be done correctly, uh, like everything with a Jeep. Although it's simple and it will run until it falls apart and you can have really terrible tolerances in here and the rattling and it'll, it'll still continue to work. When you're setting it up, you need to do it right. So the first thing we're doing it right is the correct components. Now, as you know, there's loads of repro bits out there. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. The TAS stuff seems to be the best stuff I've found. So we've got a couple of grand's worth of components here ready to build this transmission. So hopefully to start off with, we're going in with the good quality components which should make it more straightforward. And then the other thing is, once you've got the good bits as well, when it comes to the little bits like clips and washers, you need to get quite a few of them because when you're building it up, the key to this is the play, the end play, the movement and the accuracy of what you're doing, okay? And that's very difficult to do when you've got a transmission which comes from one Jeep, you've got new old stock parts, you've got parts which are newly manufactured. They're all gonna be slightly different. The manufacturing tolerance is gonna be slightly different and your case is gonna be worn slightly different as well to what it would have been originally. So to make things fit properly and to get the pr proper movement in there, you need to get a couple of the same things. So look at this. I've got four, four of the same clip here and I'll show you why. I think these are NOS, these ones, right? These are NOS from one place, 915, okay? And then I think this is another NOS one. This, this guy here, he's a big boy. This is 1035, okay? Same clip, same part, does the same job, different sizes from different places. Probably both original manufacturer. Maybe this is one from the 60s. Maybe this is one from uh, 1940. You know, you just can't say. So to get the tolerances correctly, you have to have a couple of the same thing. Same goes with these washers here. These are the washers for the um, cluster gear over there. So when you're setting up your cluster gear end play, sometimes you know you might find it's too wide or sometimes it's it's too loose. So get a couple of different washers from different manufacturers, from different dealers, so when you come to put it together, you can get it set up exactly right with the different thicknesses, you know. So that's the important parts with this really is having some good parts to start off with, good components, and then a lot of variability in the washers and things that you use with it so that you can set it up correctly so that the tolerances will be right. So that's the starting point for this transmission then. Here's the first problem, it didn't take long. 
look at that. That's the snap ring which is supposed to go in there. You can see it's in there, but look, it's overlapping. So they haven't left enough space with this snap ring um, between the two ends to actually get the blooming thing to fit. So look at that. I've got to pull it out again and cut it back a little bit. But this is what I'm talking about with parts. You get the parts. That's a snap ring it's supposed to go in there. It's not right. So this is what you've got to deal with. Well, as you can see there, that's why I don't like working on gearboxes. It's a bit, it's a bit of a pain getting those needle bearings in there. They're probably going to fall out anyway. But um, this is the main shaft. We've got a retaining snap ring on there, the big fat one. And then we've got this um, sort of wiper, which will go on a seal on the rear here to stop any oil going out the back. Also put in the se double sealed bearings as well. So no oil can escape out into the transfer case, hopefully. So main shaft's ready to go in. You slide the main shaft in and then you put the reverse gear on and then the... Um, second gear and then the synchro as well so you have to sort of thread it in and do it all it's a it's a real faff it's it's not easy to do so let's open up some of this task stuff and see what we've got then this is the should be nice so this should be oh look at that that's a brand new task synchro then didn't use one of these used a willies of france one in the um, gpw so interested to see how this works out then so that's looking pretty nice there it's all TAS, it's all matched so it's all got to be pretty good so that's a that's a beauty that is, so we'll put that in. And then, oh, before that, what else have we got? Oh, there you go. First reverse gear, ready to go in as well. And then the last thing needed on here is second gear. Beautiful, hot to trot. Right, let's get this in. Right fellow inmates, it's a few days later, actually it's a week later, and I've been locked inside the house with my wife and my daughter due to this uh, coronavirus outbreak. So we haven't been able to get a huge amount done here. Hopefully this fits in with how the video was going, but you know, we'll see how we get on with it. And, and apologies if you can hear Princess Frozen or something going on in the background as well, because obviously we're all in the house. So um, yeah, can't usually keep it as quiet as I normally would, but We've got this all together. This is where I got to. I was filming it, but I've um, sort of had to come back to it. Um, when you're building these things, you've got to put the transmission, uh, excuse me, you've got to put the transmission and the transfer case and bolt them all together, which is why I don't like working on them because it's a huge faff. And you can only get this set up correctly if you do it because um, when you tighten up the nut on the back of the uh, main shaft, it pulls it backwards and that sets up the amount of slack you have here on these blocking rings. So you can only set it up with a transfer case. So they're a bit of a pain to do. But actually, looking at it, using all these TAS parts, it seems to be working out fine without any shimming in it, okay? So this is the sort of the, the amount of movement you get on the blocking ring here, which is the fore and aft is what we're looking at. It moves really freely. It's not too much and it's not too little, you know, it's not waggling around, it's not going off to one side or anything like that. Then if I just help line it up a little bit, it changes really easily. There's quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of wobble in this, this TAS, uh, these TAS parts here, but I don't think it, you know, it's what it's designed. I don't think it's bad or anything like that. It changes really nicely and easily. 
and this is second gear setup then and it's a little bit tighter than uh, third gear but it still moves freely there's very little fore and aft play now you can actually move these um, these little locks forwards and backwards a bit which changes it but um, yeah I don't think it's excessive or it's too little or too much you know it seems just right as long as it's not dragging second gear yeah I think this is all right without actually having to do any shimming to it so what I'm going to do now then is I'm going to disassemble the top portion we'll get the cluster gear underneath ready which is a bit of a bear to do uh, and then we'll come up to the top reassemble it with everything in it rebolt it back together without the um, gasketing between it and then ch put the tower on it and make sure that it all works when it's all complete together and then we can take it apart again and then we can start gasketing up the rear and then bolting it up for the final time because you've got to check it multiple times to make sure everything's okay because things affect each other you know so we'll see how the um, forks affect you know the um, shifter forks affect it because obviously you push it right forward that's how it is now but when the shifter forks on there and the, and the um, detents which set how far the fork goes backwards and forwards is in there it might actually hold it in a slightly different place like there maybe or something like that and that can affect things as well so we'll set it all together try it see how it goes and then take it apart again and then hopefully do it for its final build so that we can put it in the jeep so right let's get this thing apart again right she's all got apart again and um, this just adds to the fact that I absolutely hate working on transmissions and transfer cases Love building Jeeps, hate transmissions and transfer cases, okay? But I'm keeping it together. This is what I do, okay? So you can see I've got two shafts. There's an old main shaft and a new main shaft. I put a whole load of grease on the washers that I've set up. So they're held at each end. And then the main shafts are just going through just enough just to help keep the washers in place there. And then I'll try to drop the cluster gear in from above without knocking them off. It's really difficult to do, um, you'll have to do it a couple of times, it'll make you swear, it, it's not a fun job. But this is one of the ways that I've found to do it and it sort of works. She's going down, and then you... Oh, shh. SH something. Come on, you look. How have you come off the shaft? Oh, you, you little. Oh, you. Oh, flip it yes, spinning it upside down worked. So I got it upside down, withdrew the main shaft out this end, and I could get my finger in, just move the washer back. I should have thought of this earlier. Move the washer back into place, and was able to get the shaft through. And then this is this is what it's like when it's in there, there is no play you can feel. You know, it doesn't move at all. And um, that's how it should be. I can't, as like I said earlier, I can't remember the tolerance on it, but it's very, very little um, movement. You know, you have to pry it with a screwdriver and put your dial gauge on the end there to see the end play. It's not something you can feel yourself. If it feels, you know, like there's no movement and it rotates freely, pretty freely, that's good, I think, with these things. So the only problem is, of course, like I said, We've now got to take the shaft out a little bit and let it drop down um, so that we can put the other gears in. And to do that, I can't remember exactly how I did it. I think I put in, I put in a bar or something. Oh, ah, yeah, I think I use this. So instead of the main shaft, I push it out and I use this, which is a bit smaller than the main shaft, to hold all the um, washers in place and everything like that. So the gear is able to drop down and then you can pick it back up again. I think that's what I've done previously. So um, <laughs> let's give that a shot and see if that's actually what happens. Let's, let's try that. She's dropped down a touch. We'll have a look in a second whether that's right or not or enough or whether I have to do something else. But let's get out this uh, brand new reverse idler gear. And when I say brand new, I of course mean 1960s or something brand new. 
We've got an interesting problem here that I didn't foresee, okay? Right, my new idler, reverse idler gear, doesn't seem to have a slight raised section there. Um, that this is an identical gear, actually. The markings on it are all identical. But if I just remove this one quick. So this is the one I removed from the Ford box. It's actually a fine one. It's got some chipping on the teeth there where people have mashed um, reverse, you know, into gear here. But actually the teeth and everything are fine. I think it's a pretty good gear. Same markings here, but you can see it has a slight raised area which is worn on this one. And that's probably a um, couple of thou. 5,000, something like that, maybe. And that makes a bit of a difference. So with this one in, you get, that's the teeth play, and then there's a forward and backwards, okay? I don't think the case is worn. I've looked carefully at these areas, and it doesn't look worn. And then, you know, the cluster gear is very tight in there as well. So I don't think the case has been abused and really worn. It's the difference in the gear. So there's no information given on how much play you should have on the reverse gear. So if I walk out the... Uh, this reverse gear, so this is the worn one out of the Ford box. Now this is this one, doesn't have slight raised area on it. Same markings, same manufacturer, slightly different. And if we put him in, there's 16 thou play, end play, right? And then this is the 16. You can hear it's quite, goes forward and backwards a little bit more, makes a little bit more noise. So really, what I thought about was sanding down one of these spare washers I have and using that as a shim, because I don't see what the problem is. This one wears, you know, on steel to steel with the case, or, you know, steel to cast iron or whatever it is, on the case. So just having a shim in there instead, or a washer, bronze washer should be good. But the problem is, this is 30, this was 31.5 thou thick. I've got it down to 30 thou after half an hour of hand sanding it, which is not easy. So I'd have to remove another 15 thou, so another 10 times as much, to get it to be, to make the gear fit exactly with no end place. So obviously, you have to remove half of the um, area of this, um, half the thickness of this washer, which is gonna take forever. So I don't think using a washer is an option, but using an okay worn gear perhaps is. I think that's what I'm gonna to have to do, just because there's too much play in that. It'll be quite noisy. And this one, I think, is fine. The teeth aren't chipped, the hardening isn't come off it. It's just these bashes here, but you know they don't make too much difference. So, although I'm using all new gears in here, I think we're gonna to have to go with the good used reverse here, just to get rid of that end play, because it's gonna make too much noise all the time, sort of rattling around in there, because the, the reverse idler runs all the time. It's always attached to the cluster gear. So it's always running, it'll always be making a noise. It'll be quite a noisy box, just because of that one gear. These are the things you got to deal with. Right, just been grinding off those little nicks and things like that off the end there. This is where the other gear whacks into and then slides in there to put it in reverse. So this is where the damage goes. But really with a bit of grinding off there, dressing it out a little bit, I think it's fine. I think this gear is going to be good to use. It's going to be better than having the rattly new gear in there. I mean, there's no reason to replace this in the first place. It was just because I could. Um, it's reverse idler gear, you don't use it a huge amount or anything like that. So yeah, I think he's going in, we're gonna go with him. So here she all is, buttoned up then. It took a long time. It wasn't, you know, terrible, but it wasn't the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. I don't like working on them, but I think she's all right. So uh, she's in reverse at the moment. So let's just have a listen. This is what it sounds like. This is what, you know, the new gears and everything inside a top, you know, a box set up to spec and everything feels like. So if you turn the, the input, it's like that, and then if you turn the output, that's re that's reverse. A lot of the noise is coming from back here in the transfer case because we are in um, low range at the moment. So that's the straight cut gears working at the moment. They're very noisy, so this would be low range reverse noise, which is pretty noisy. But then let's um, let's bring her into neutral. Trying to align it to get it to go into gear, isn't it? easy with the straight cut gears you have to get them right there you go that is first should be that way actually return that way neutral going easily now and then second third or that way should I say so 
all working. Well, Jeepterman, it is a week later and this thing is looking pretty rough, but actually it's really good. And like a lot of things in life, it's got to get worse before it gets better, especially at the moment. So I'm really pleased with how this is going currently. Just so you can see straight away some bits here. This was where it was a bit wavy still showing a bit, a bit too much of its age. I know we want some um, patina and age in this vehicle, but just back here was just a bit too rough. So I'm in the process of filling it at the moment. That's just a layer of um, oxide primer on there just to see how it looks. You can see there's a sharp line there, which isn't properly sanded back. So that's got to be sorted. Um, but we're just filling in a little bit of the waviness there just to make it look a little bit better. I know lots of you guys said, don't do that. I'm not removing all the character from the Jeep. It's just some bits. The other thing was, on the dash there, there were some, well, they were filled holes, but you could still see them and they were too noticeable for me. So they're getting filled. Um, same down here as well. You can see you've got the original sort of stress marks when this was formed, but here was just a bit too rough. So this is getting filled and re-sanded back down just to make it look a touch nicer. So those are some of the visible things. We've got handles on as well. All of it's got the correct EC marked bolts for an MB. Now, those of you who talk about Fords and are like, well, you've got to collect all the Ford bolts. When you're working on an MB, let me tell you, it's even worse because it's not just Ford bolts you've got to collect, it's M uh, EC marked bolts, CTR marked bolts, AA bolts. They all go in different places as well. EC seems to be on body parts, CTR seems to be on the front here. A at parts go on the engine, AA go on the transmission and transfer case. So <laughs> there's loads of different bolts to collect. So it's worse than Ford's, okay. But I was worried that I'd have to take the uh, tub off, okay, because I had to drill two holes underneath here to hold the tub down finally, okay, because this floor here has all been replaced. So this holes had to be drilled here. Now, the problem is that to get a drill in there, it's not easy. If we come underneath, you can see where it is there, right? So to get the drill in, it'll be an angle when you drill. So I was like, well, what am I going to do here? I'd have to take the tub off like I did last time, stand it on its end and then, you know, stand it up here and then drill the holes and then put it back down. Obviously, with the whole Corona fun going on at the moment, that's not possible to get somebody to help. So all I did then is I got a drill with a small drill bit, drilled in at an angle as much as I could and it worked. I was quite pleased with that. So it drilled up in an angle. It came through the floor. I could just see it poking out. And then I worked my way across from where that it was showing and drilled with a proper drill bit down for the bolt. And that was in the correct place. So I was able to drill in the correct place. So the tub doesn't have to come off. It is on there finally. And it's worked out really nice, actually. What's the other thing with this rough looking beast then? On the rear, we've got an original World War II Firestone tire. This is interesting because this is made in England. So I think it's World War II, but it's a uh, Lend-Lease or manufactured in the UK, which is pretty cool. So that goes with it being a UK Jeep. So that's really nice. So we've got the um, used part worn original tire on the rear there. So that's pretty neat. And then coming around other bits, fuel tanks in, all plumbed in. Well, mostly plumbed in. Original handles on there. Some more repair work going on. Transmission and transfer case went in fine. I use a transmission jack like I did on the GPW, put it on the side here, roll it underneath, crank it up underneath, and then you've got your transmission and transfer case in which you bolt on on the side. So that was nice and straightforward. That went um, really easy. An interesting thing I was just thinking about with handles there is that, you know, we're doing this, where is he? Ah, here we go. You know, we're doing this, um, we're going quite full out with this, right? It's an interesting thing. This is a Ford handle, okay? Yeah, just my daughter coming outside. This is a Ford handle, right? This is a good one. So why didn't I use this on the MB? Well, they're different and you can see the difference here. Now, spot the difference. Yeah, you can see there's a f the way that they're formed is different. The MB ones are much more sort of rough and it's just squashed there. Whereas the Ford ones have more of a profile and a shape to them. You see the MB one is just squashed. So didn't want to put Ford ones on there. So got hold of some proper MB ones. So it's got real MB grab handles on it, which is awesome. And around the front, you can see that red monstrosity there is a six volt battery for this, which is going to be an Optima red top. Now, I know what you're thinking. We're not going to leave it like that. What I've managed to get hold of is something quite cool. In America, Bobby Lentz has very kindly sent to me a Willard battery case, right? He has made these out of resin, I think, and they're awesome. So look at this, right? This is it. This is what we're going to have. There's my battery case. Take the top off it, drop the Optima in it, put the top back on, seal it all in. 
you'll never know that there's a modern 6 volt battery in it. It'll look exactly like a World War II Willard. So that's really awesome. So I'm really looking forward to getting that seated in there and everything. You can see how the Optima will be. It goes at an angle there. I think these are only 50 amp hours, so I'm hoping it's got a good cranking power for starting the Jeep, but it hasn't got a huge capacity, so I'm hoping it's going to be all right. But they do have a lower capacity than many of the other, you know, normal lead acid six volt batteries. Here we go. Look, in typical fashion, I couldn't control myself and just got on with it. So I put the uh, red top in there and look, this is how it looks. Obviously, it's a bit rough at the moment. It still needs some fettling and we'll seal it all in with black sealant. So you'll, you'll never tell that it's been, uh, you know, it's in two pieces. This will all be painted up to look like lead and everything like that. So it'll all look perfect when it's finished, but it just gives you an idea of what this is going to be like. So that's going to look awesome. You'll never be able to tell that that's not a real World War II battery in there, which is cool. Um, my original battery cable here might need a new connector on the end of it. <laughs> Look at that. That has been eaten. So yeah, I think we need a new uh, connector on the end there. But yeah, we'll do some more fettling to this. Get these a little bit higher because they're just sitting a bit low there. You can't really get the, um, the connector onto them properly. So um, yeah, but that's going to be awesome. Well pleased with that. Thanks, Bobby. Good work, mate. Well done. Are you ready to push? Right, you push. Oh, you're not going to help. Go. Mama. Are you pushing? Mama. Oh, God, the more you put in it, the heavier it gets. Oh, I hope you haven't... Oh, oh. I'm stuck on the ledge. Oh. <laughs> 